I Was Made to Love You is the gateway to one of the most astonishing stretches of television I have ever experienced. I can say without hyperbole that the Buffy and Angel run of Reprise, The Body, and Epiphany changed my life. Those episodes are largely responsible for the existence of this video series, and I have been variously excited and anxious about what I might say about them for nearly eight years now. I say gateway because while I don't have the same reverence for it as I do the next three, I Was Made to Love You's final scene contains a cliffhanger that triggers the run. And I think that presents a challenge in giving the rest of this episode its due. The next three are so emotional, dramatic, and outright traumatizing that I Was Made to Love you has always sat in a long shadow for me, little more in my memory than that one episode right before you know what happens, or the one with Warren. That is, until our recent rewatch and stream discussion of it here on the channel, when I finally realized there's a lot more interesting stuff to this one that I'd noticed previously. So, for the purposes of this discussion, I've decided that beyond this introduction, I'm not going to talk about the cliffhanger in this video. An argument can be made either way, but I believe that whatever ideas the cliffhanger generates for discussion won't be diminished by waiting one more episode to discuss them. Leaving them in kind of wipes away some of the interesting nuance of I Was Made to Love You, and yes, I realize that that is probably part of the point. Picking right up from Spike being uninvited from the Summers' house, Buffy is working off a bit of her Spike-induced revulsion by beating up a bag of Xander. I feel gross, you know, like, like, dirty. That's ridiculous. You can't be responsible for what Spike thinks or feels. There's probably an analysis already written out there someplace regarding what an interesting contrast this is. Giles' hardline response to Buffy's Spike news versus Joyce and Willow's reaction in the previous episode, which involved at least partially questioning whether Buffy had some culpability for leading Spike on. Honey, did you somehow... Uh, unintentionally lead him on in any way. I do beat him up a lot. Puffy continues to vent her frustrations until Puffy Xander objects, and I'm not sure that I understand the training value of Puffy Beanbag Xander, other than the hilarious sight gag and Buffy getting some revenge for Xander laughing about Spike's crush in the previous episode. He's so immobile, he's incapable of threatening her in any way just wobbling from one side of the room to the other. How is that helpful? Anyways, Buffy wonders if maybe she needs to be a little less Buffy to attract a man, and Xander brings my favorite version of Xander to the scene, the you're my hero Xander. Or maybe you can just be Buffy, he'll see your amazing heart, and he'll fall in love with you. The next morning, Joyce is doing a fashion show for the girls because she's going on a date that evening. I absolutely love them grilling her about her date Brian's intentions. Joyce's anxious questioning of the choice of movie as a date is deeply relatable. I believe I've had just that same conversation with a friend before an online date. Or maybe a movie isn't a good idea at all because... We know you can't talk during. Anya and Tara are out for a walk, and Anya is telling Tara about avoiding big tech while investing. I couldn't help but wonder what she'd have to say about NFTs and crypto. And this is when they run into April. Hi. Hi. A nice girl looking for Warren. At a party that night, after dancing with Xander, Buffy sees this super cool dude wearing a snorkel and drunkenly wobbling over the punch bowl, but decides to lower her standards and talk to Ben instead. Personally, I don't get it, but I love her placing herself in a position where she can't be missed and pulling the, oh, hi, didn't see you there move. In walks April, and Anya catches Xander up. She speaks with a strange evenness and selects her words a shade too precisely. That may be the most chef's kiss Anya line ever, though it might be impossible to pick. Which ones are yours? My other is probably... Men are evil. Will you go with me? Spike tries to make Buffy jealous by whispering in April's ear, and April tosses him through a window. Buffy goes home to bail out Giles from babysitting duty. Dear God, Buffy, there's only so much I can take. It's an Aspen's end, so I can't possibly fit every delightful line into a summary. The Giles scene is almost completely composed from them, as he describes his evening with Dawn before Joyce comes home and mortifies Buffy with talk about her date. It's some of the most humanizing and fun writing Joyce has had in the series so far. That's right, I said so far, because we're not 
going to talk about it. The next day, the team figures out who Warren is that Robot April is looking for. They express pity for the loneliness that might drive someone to build a sex bot, and Buffy goes and calls a very glistening post-glory transformation Ben. They line up coffee. Warren and his girlfriend Katrina are packing to run from April when Buffy knocks to enlist his aid. Spike stops by the magic box to see the Scoobies, but finds that he's lost some of his Yoko powers. We are not your friends. We are not your way to Buffy. There is no way to Buffy. God, I love it when Daddy Giles gets a little ripper energy going. Anthony can be truly chilling when he needs to be. <laughs> well, now that would have made me a real piece of shit, wouldn't it? April attacks Katrina. Warren tries to talk her down and then turns her on Buffy. She growls? You made her so she growls? We get a shockingly touching scene between Buffy and April. Spike goes to Warren to have him build a robot for him based on Buffy. In a conversation with Xander, Buffy decides she doesn't need a guy right now and calls Ben to cancel their coffee date. Glory overhears, and that's how it all ends. What a fun light episode. I Was Made to Love You is surprisingly funny, sweet, and endearing. Actually, maybe not that surprising, given it's an Espenson. I wasn't a huge fan of the episode Ted, but I love the use of it in the show shows fantasy lore. Warren is just some weird science 20-something who built an April in his dorm room. Maybe he's the original Ted's nephew. I also love that Dawn is the one who makes the Ted callback. A robot? Really? Was it Ted? Because of course the monks provided her with all of the requisite memories, including the Ted ones. One of the fun questions of this season is how all the stories we know might have played a little differently with Dawn in them. The part of April was actually written with Britney Spears in mind. According to David Fury, Britney turned it down because she wanted to play someone who, you know, hung out with the Scoobies, not a, well, you know. She's a sex bot. Right. I think I'm personally glad for the way things turned out. Shonda Farr, the actress who plays Robot April, does a great job of infusing April with warmth and humanity without losing the robot shtick. April is actually nicely complex. There's a lot of symbolic stuff going on here that wouldn't have worked if April were just, well, you know. He's a sex bot. Right. That. And not that the episode is kink-shaming. I believe it was Sarah from Costume Codex who, in our discussion of the episode, made the salient point, no one has any problems with your sex toys. Just don't make them look like anyone else, sentient, or feel pain when you're not around. If you call her and she doesn't answer, it hurts her? There are a handful of fun jokes layered into April's operating system we see from her vantage point, including that April is programmed to think that Warren is a snappy dresser and a good dancer, and has a routine to keep him happy called Give Him Presents. I also love the spelling error like the way in Remove Obstacle, he spelled obstacle like testicle. However, avoiding spoilers as best I can, Warren is such a heinous, vile character that it makes some of those cute jokes in this episode, uh less cute. The episode contains a strange technical issue, starting at the second to last commercial break. While everything to that point has the familiar warm reds and pinks that the season has been bathed in, starting at the scene with Buffy and Xander fixing the window, something happened to the episode's color correction. Every scene except the cliffhanger has a yellowish green tint. Maybe these scenes were very late in the game additions that didn't get the proper time in the editing bay? Or perhaps there was an issue with the DVD mastering? There is a similar issue with the color in some seasons and seven episodes. It's just odd that the problem is only there for one story block in this one and not the whole thing. Even more painfully, I went and checked the Abominable remaster and the color problem is fixed there, along with having all the new ridiculous issues the remaster introduced. But my pickiest of nits with this one is that I couldn't stop asking myself, why is Warren running? Maybe it's the Star Trek in me. If you had an off switch, Doctor, would you not keep it secret? But it seems almost impossible to me that he wouldn't have given April an off switch. Entwined dualities are a big part of this season's thematic structure, two different halves of one whole. There's always the push and pull of young Buffy with her calling as the Slayer. Toth wanted to divide Buffy into those parts, but managed to do so with Xander instead. In this episode, we get a glimpse of a classic, Ripper and Giles. And of course, there is Ben and Glory. Because of that emphasis, it's no surprise that relationships, an inherent duality, themselves have been a big feature of the stories this season. I mentioned in the video for Restless how Whedon portrayed Terra and Willow as a yin and yang, light and dark. That structure may become more relevant as the season continues. The more I watch the show, the more surprised I am by how well Spike works throughout the series as a dark yang to Buffy. <laughs> Bloody hell. 
and Crush was about his consuming need for romantic validation, without which... I'm nothing without her. If Triangle was about Buffy's post-Riley grief, I Was Made to Love You is about her figuring out how to move forward. Or, you know, where does she uh, go? You know, from here. Doing that well and avoiding the same mistakes means processing and understanding the mistakes you've made. And all of that is what's at the heart of this episode. Buffy's first attempt is to just get back out there. And in doing so, she nearly initiates the same familiar relationship loop she's been in all over again. Angel was a reforming monster who suffered a relapse of monsterdom and became the season's big bad. Riley was essentially an indoctrinated member of an elite government agency who turned out to be the big bad. Or at the very least, the one whose hubris spawned the big bad. Then, things with Riley really started to go downhill. By the middle part of this episode, Buffy's attempt to just get back out there has her on the way to starting something with the magically conjoined twin of this season's big bad. We've talked about the trap of relationship looping, previously with Spike's romantic history and with Angel in the Prodigal. By default, most people are bad at being lonely and treat it like an illness to cure. The two most common forms of the loop are to constantly get into a relationship with the same problem, or to pendulum back and forth. One relationship didn't work, go for the opposite. You know, you really should get yourself a boring boyfriend. That was the idea. Riley was supposed to be Mr. Joe Guy. I mean, I thought he was dependable. Essentially, they are variations of the same behavior. The interruption of Buffy's new loop here comes in the form of Warren and April, and I think it's fair to read Warren and April as another duality from this season, accounting for why Buffy, at different points in the episode, identifies with both of them. Since Buffy's connections with April are more straightforward, let's start with her similarities to Warren. Are you okay? Mm, I'm fine. I just uh, threw up in my mouth a little bit. Essentially, Warren is Buffy's loneliness and ego. In the scene in the Magic Box, the Scoobies describe April's creator as pitiable for not being able to find a partner and having to build an April. That conversation is the impetus for Buffy to leave the room and call Ben for a coffee date. Incidentally, and for no reason whatsoever, I just wanted to point out that it is Tara who expresses compassion for Warren in that conversation. Tara. Yep. Anyway, later Buffy actually meets Warren, and in between his toxic nonsense, he occasionally says things that Buffy relates to. April, who was always there, and always everything Warren needed her to be, got boring, which bears a whiff of something Buffy became guilty of with Riley. In the video for Crush, I talked about Sartre's two varieties of bad faith romantic love, the sadist and the masochist. Warren is the sadist, demanding that his romantic partners abandon their authentic selves to fit him. I mean, I felt like I deserved to have someone. You know, I mean, everyone deserves to have someone. On the surface of it, that is an emotionally relatable idea, but actually no individual deserves to have any other individual. Certainly Warren, who expresses some textbook characteristics of narcissism, does not. Warren believes himself a good person without needing to demonstrate it, and thinks of everyone around him as playing a character in his story. His sense of entitlement informs the decisions he makes that Buffy would never do. April and, by association, Buffy represent the masochistic bad faith romantic style. There are a ton of parallels between April and Buffy in this one. April is a beautiful, super strong, not just a girl who acts on the whims of her male programmer. The council fights evil. The slayer is the instrument by which we fight. The episode opens with Buffy suggesting maybe she needs to convert herself to be more what a man might want. Actually, these are orthopedic pants. <laughs> more of an April. And this time around, I noticed that after each episode of violence, April sounded apologetic and sad for what she was programmed to do. If I hurt you just now, I am sorry. You have to stop lying. <gasps> then, of course, in their final scene together, April expresses confusion over what has happened. I've rechecked everything. I did everything I was supposed to do. I was a good girlfriend. What else do you want from me, Riley? I've given you everything that I have. I've given you my heart, my body, and soul. Before she dies on the swing. As usual, and get your bingo cards ready, the key is choice. While I love their regular parallels, Spike doesn't get one lacking a soul. The jury is still out on Chippy Spike, though the episode misdirects us for a moment into believing that Spike is going to do as Ripper says and move the hell on, when really... Your specs. Warren, a sadistic narcissist, pretty much only has one set of operating instructions, and April never got a choice because Warren didn't program one for her. But Buffy, 
breaks out of the loop by the end of the episode and makes the choice to fly solo for a while rather than subverting her identity to fit someone new or seeking out another Riley. I need to get comfortable being alone with Buffy. She may not clearly understand what happened with Riley or how things are supposed to be different in the future, but she's given herself the time to figure it out, discovering who she is alone, unifying the two parts of herself we see in this one, the sometimes selfish, lonely, and naive, vulnerable side, and the powerful, relentless side of herself who faces the ugly in the world every day. Her decision is a beautiful thing, because knowing your authentic self whole and complete is the vital part of avoiding Sartre's pitfalls in relationships. There are so many things here I identify with, things that just take a lot of time and a lot of ache to understand. But I love Buffy's decision because loneliness isn't an infection that requires a cure. Almost without exception, the only thing that feeling lonely means is that we're probably alone. The rest is just layers of story that we make up about why. I could spend less time slang. I could laugh at his jokes. I mean, Men like that, right? The, the joke laughing at? Or maybe you can just be Buffy, he'll see your amazing heart, and he'll fall in love with you. In the end, I got a lot more out of this one than I ever had before. It's sweet, funny, and surprisingly prescient. The string of episodes from this one to The Gift actually feels like a test run for some of the themes explored in Season 6, and Buffy's final scene with April is so surprisingly touching. What with all of their parallels, it feels like a moment of intimate connection where Buffy actually allows herself some compassion. Maybe this is a girlfriend test. If I wait here patiently this time, He'll come back. What do you want me to say? Lie to me. I'm sure he will. He'll tell you how sorry he is. You know, he told me how proud he was of you, and he didn't mean to hurt you. Still, time marches forward. An indifferent reality rears its head. Knowing what we know, April's last line is less a cheerful affirmation during a dark moment than a foreboding warning of darkness to come. And as I watched this time, I was struck by how, batteries running down, there was a moment where April's voice reminded me of someone else. Things are always darkest before... Be back before dawn. Thank you.